Hi, it's Chris. Welcome back to Catching Photons. So, you know that I love astrophotography. I love taking images of galaxies or nebula or star clusters. But when it comes to backyard astroscience, I really go crazy. Long story short, I think there are two main approaches to astrophotography images. The one approach is the longhand approach, where you really plan your image days in beforehand, where you sit down, open Stellarium, find the best target, then prepare everything, plan your camera, the filters, the framing, you go out, you shoot multiple nights and you really get your data clean, then you sit down, process a whole bunch of days and then you get a really cool image and it's exactly the image you planned. So that's approach number one. So within the second approach, I wanted to take an image of the Leo triplet and I had the laptop running right here to set up everything and get everything running, but then I saw within Stellarium uh, the name Vesta right next to the Leo triplet and I thought, what is Vesta? I opened up Wikipedia and Vesta is an asteroid and I thought, what? How cool is that? Can I image an asteroid from my backyard? And I immediately cancelled the Leo triplet and slew my telescope to Vesta and Vesta was right into the frame and I really could see an asteroid from my backyard <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I did a bit of research. Vesta is an asteroid within the asteroid belt. It has an aperture of roughly 500 kilometers and thereby it's the second largest asteroid by mass and by volume after the dwarf planet Ceres. It is too small to be a dwarf planet because it's too small to form a sphere with its own gravity. But within the asteroid belt it's the biggest so-called protoplanet. A cool random fact from Wikipedia, debris from the forming events of Vesta actually landed on Earth. There are meteoroids called HED meteoroids that are really from Vesta, right here on Earth. That's so cool. I was lucky. Vesta is actually the brightest asteroid visible from Earth, so no wonder that I could spot Vesta with my telescope. Vesta was visited by NASA's Dawn spacecraft. It entered orbit around Vesta at the 16th of July 2011 and stayed there for roughly one year of exploration. As I said, Vesta orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter within the main asteroid belt. And within that main asteroid belt, Vesta is the second most massive body. The surface area of Vesta is roughly the size of Texas and North Carolina combined, something about 800,000 square kilometers. The temperature on its surface has been estimated to be between minus 20 degrees, but with the Sun right overhead in summertime, and minus 190 degrees Celsius at the winter pole, so a freezing cold body. Quick side note, Heinrich Olbers discovered Vesta in 1802 and uh, Hansi had discovered a few dwarf planets, they were called planets back then, already. He gave the right to name the new body to the German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss and Gauss decided to call the new body after the Roman goddess of uh, home and Heart. Vesta. Great choice. Okay, enough of that. This is my Skywatcher Newtonian telescope with a focal length of 750 mm. And I just plugged this DSLR right onto the scope. I used nothing else, no Barlow lens, nothing, and just pointed the telescope right onto Vesta. I then took images with roughly 10 minutes in between over a period of several hours. Now, here comes the game. Olbers discovered Vesta, but he also was able to calculate the orbit of Vesta. I already calculated the orbit of Mercury by using the transit of Mercury in front of the Sun. The underlying geometry was a bit simpler back then because when uh, Mercury transits the Sun I exactly know that Mercury is between me and the Sun in a straight line so I can draw triangles more easily. This time South is in this direction and Vesta is right over there. So within my thoughts of calculating the orbit of Vesta, I need to incorporate that orbit into the calculations. But we're gonna see. But imagine if we really could pull this off and calculate the orbit of Vesta just using the data of our little telescope. That would be super cool. Okay, so let's start with what we wanna do. We like to calculate the orbit of Vesta using nothing else than the observation data. And we want to do this just because we can and because I think that such things are funny and maybe you agree on that. As we have only limited data, we are going to need some simplifications, but more on that later. Then let's have a look at what data we have to work with in the first place. 
I took images of 30 seconds each, over a period of several hours, and there are 10 minutes between each image. In total we have 25 images spanning from 8.30pm to half past midnight. Here, these are the images, and you can clearly see Vesta moving relative to the background stars. That alone is just super cool to watch, I love it. We're gonna need that movement as the most important working tool for our calculations. Okay, let's go. We start by drawing a sketch of the current situation. We have the Sun over here and Earth right here and then Vesta with some angle over here. This angle is important and we call it Alpha for no reasons. This line behind us, so to speak, is the meridian at midnight. It points to south and straight away from Earth, seeing everything in projected 2D and from above. This is simplification number one. It is important because Vesta is not in opposition, not on a straight line with Sun and Earth. So in any case we need to incorporate this angle of Vesta and our meridian at midnight into our calculations. Okay, what else do we have? We have an observed movement of Vesta relative to the background stars, that's clear. Over a certain period of time Vesta moves a tiny angle from our perspective. We're gonna call this angle beta. I drew Vesta on a definite point here, but we actually don't know where it is, because we don't know the distance yet, and all we know is that Vesta is somewhere along this line, and moved some angle better after the time interval delta t. But if we simplify orbital geometry a bit, we can draw a rectangular triangle and pretend that Vesta moved on a straight line within this time interval. This is simplification number two. I mean, this is actually reasonable, because the orbit is gigantic and everything is a straight line if you watch just close enough. This is one major rule of analysis. Okay, we want to name all the other sections with seemingly arbitrary variables, but this one is delta s. It is the distance Vesta traveled within our time of observation. It's gonna be important later on. And this line here, this is the radius of Vesta to the Sun, and this is what we are looking for in the first place. Okay, okay, that looks good so far. Now we need to check things we already know. I assume we know the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and there are many ways to figure that out, but not in this video. And we also know delta T, this is 13,766 seconds, one image was taken at 8.35.37pm and the second image at 0.2503 after midnight. Okay, next thing we need this angle alpha. We said this line here is the meridian at midnight, so roughly. So I used my phone compass, pointed it at Vesta and the angle between this direction and due south was something like 37 degrees. So let's just take that. So now this angle beta is still left, so the trick for beta goes like this. We can count the pixels that Vesta traveled on our sensor. We thereby overlay the two images and align the background stars very carefully. And then we find the center of Vesta in both images and read the x and y coordinates from both images. I mean, we could do that with every image pair and average the movement, but <laughs> hence I'm lazy. Come on, just let's stick with this. So using Pythagoras, we can calculate the distance Vesta traveled between both images to be 119.775 pixels. And now what? What is one pixel? It is an angle of the sky we cover and we can use any field of view calculator online to enter the specs of the camera and the scope and read the angular resolution of our camera system. For my scope with 750mm focal length and my Canon EOS 700D, the angular resolution is 1.17 arcseconds per pixel or divide this by 60 times 60, 0.000325 degrees per pixel. And now we only need to multiply this with the pixels Vesta traveled and we conclude Vesta covered an angle of 0 0.038927 degrees within the time of our observation. And this is the angle beta we wanted. Okay, so good, so good, but what can we do with this observation? We still don't know how far Vesta is away and thereby we can't say anything about Vesta's speed. See. If Vesta was close it would be slow and if it was further away it would be faster because delta s would get bigger and thereby Vesta would cover a bigger distance in the same time aka a bigger velocity. And we can't tell because all we know is that Vesta is somewhere along this line. But we can use a good old trick. Whenever you think you'd float away in uncertainty, Newton's laws of gravity holds you firmly on the ground. <laughs> no, let's use them. Ideas like that. We express the velocity as a function of the distance to the sun. We don't know the distance, so we don't know the speed. There are two unsolved variables. 
But we can also tell, by Newton's laws of gravity, the speed a certain object needs to have on a given orbit with a given distance to the Sun. See, the trick is that every object, no matter the mass, has the same speed on the same orbit. And we know Vesta is on a stable orbit, or at least that's what we assume. So we want to use those two equations and cancel one variable out, leaving us with only one. We better choose the distance of Vesta to the Sun, and then we have the orbit, okay? Okay, let's go. This triangle here incorporates alpha and the distance d1 and s1 and is a right angled triangle, so we say tangens alpha is d1 divided by s1. Okay. Next, this bigger triangle. It also contains the angle beta. We say tangens alpha plus beta equals d1 plus delta s divided by s1. And last but not least, this big triangle here. We don't know any angles other than this one here being rectangular and hence it's Pythagoras time. So the sum of the distance Earth-Sun plus S1 is squared plus the sum of D1 and delta S squared equals the distance Sun-Vesta squared. Okay, okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. And without any further ado, we insert one equation into the next one and so on and so forth and so on until we are only left with one equation that contains delta S and RV. Blah 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 blah, we are left with Delta S equals uh, many numbers, a square root of a square, and so on and so forth. And then the velocity of Vesta equals this term, so the covered distance delta S, divided by the time, so those 13,766 seconds. So this is the equation relative to the distance of the Sun under the limits of the observations we did on the traveled angle beta. So now all we need to do is take Newton's V equals square g times ms over radius vesta, with g being the gravitational constant, this nasty beast here, and ms the mass of the sun. And the mass of the sun is incredibly large, 1.9884 times 10 to the power of 30 kilograms. We can figure that out by precisely watching things on their circle orbits around the sun, but again, not in this video. The plan behind everything we did is now this one. We ask for the speed of Vesta, relative to the distance Vesta Sun, that not only matches our observations with the angle beta, but is also a legit Newtonian speed on this certain object, so to speak. And in mathematical language, we set both speeds equal, and thereby their terms. What distance matches both laws, our observation and Newton? And then we simply solve this equation to the radius of Vesta's orbit, and that won't work, because we did simplifications and rounded numbers on our way up. So there might be no matching point of these two dependencies, but in a perfect world that would be the way to go. But in our imperfect world, we define a distance function to both and ask my Curtis computer algebra system to find the minimal distance and thereby the best fitting value for the radius of the orbit of Vesta. And that turns out to be... 4.478661041322 times 10 to the power of 11 meters, which is, compared to Earth's 1.4995 times 10 to the power of 11 meters, something like 2.7 times the distance Sun Earth. <laughs> okay, okay, we not only got any result at all, this is an achievement in its own, but this distance is actually further away from the Sun than Earth is, and this is something what we expected. So good, so good. And now the moment of truth. We open Wikipedia and search the orbit parameters of Vesta and there it is, 2.4 times the distance Earth-Sun. And we calculated 2.7, and yes, I call it a strike. I mean, look at this, this artistic painting is actually somewhat to scale. This is the real position of Vesta, simplifying a circular orbit, and this is the orbit we calculated with nothing else than this moving dot in our image. Actually quite cool, huh? Okay, how cool is that? After calculating everything, we concluded that Vesta must be roughly about 2.7 astronomical units, this is the distance between the Sun and Earth, away from the Sun. And if we have a look at Wikipedia, it says, 2.4 astronomical units, so 2.7 compared to 2.4 just using the telescope behind me. This is so cool, I'm really excited about that. This is the cool stuff, you can image galaxies, you can image nebula, you can produce stunning images, but you also can do backyard science. You can use your equipment to really figure out things, and this is what I love most. 
Okay, folks, that was a lot of fun for me. I hope it wasn't boring for you. And I say, clear skies, everyone. Until next time, here on Catching Photons.